in reality, every agency director proposes a budget that is probably way outside of what is fundable. Mm -hmm. And then we work with our executives and our, our legislative partners to then, you know, make what is possible against the balance of priorities that folks have. Well, that's Mark Dones, CEO of the King County Regional Homelessness Authority, speaking to me on Seattle Channel recently about the proposal they and their team have just released about the KCRHA's budget and goals. How's that agency going to come through on the promises it's been making? And also, what's behind a new lawsuit facing the city over mandatory housing affordability requirements? Plus, does Governor Jay Inslee have the support he needs to pass a ma massive new budget proposal? A lot of questions out there. We're going to answer those. We'll laugh, we'll cry, we'll do it all here. It's time for Seattle News, Views, and Brews, your Coffee Break political podcast. I'm Brian Callanan. I'm a host on Seattle Channel, and the views expressed here are my own. And I'm joined by the always exciting and incredible Kevin Schofield, weekly columnist for the Seattle, Seattle, uh, South Seattle Emerald. And Kevin, I have a winter weather question for you here. What's your favorite thing to do when it's below freezing in Seattle? Is it watch people spin out when they're driving up hills or build a really, really slushy snowman? What do you think? Uh I would rather stay inside where it's nice and warm and dry yeah. and watch people doing their thing outside. Like, yeah, yeah, man, yeah. neighbor kids building a slushy snowman, you know, okay. I'm all for that. So it's, yeah. it's not me. Yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. And and make sure you're careful out there, folks. A note about that in just yeah. a second. Thank you, Kevin. As always, thanks to City Grind Espresso, our background noise sponsor for the podcast here on the audio side of things. Thank you so much for helping us out. Make sure you get a SNVB hot take espresso if you uh, ask for that special. We'll see what happens. If you're listening, please do become a patron too. We're really trying to encourage just one more person to help us out at the $10 level. It's the last time we're offering it, folks. If you pledge at that $10 level, we will send you a Seattle News Views and Brews coffee mug. We are retiring this promotion at the end of the year. This is the last mug we're making available. We're all out after this one. And a huge thanks to Pete in Fremont. He just signed on as a patron at the $10 level. I just sent a mug to the center of the universe. Pete, I hope you're enjoying that. And we have a great mug shot of the week. I wanted to show this classic flashback mug shot from Eric. The chickens eating out of the mug. Arguably the best mug shot we've ever received there. Love that one. Thank you, Eric. Thanks to everybody supporting the show. And a quick heads up from the Department of Transportation. With the winter weather happening this week, you got the warnings, you got the snow falling. Make absolutely sure you're keeping your sidewalks clear of ice and snow. If you can, try to drive a little bit less. Get yourself stocked up on groceries and be ready for changes in that forecast. We've got some tough, tough weather ahead. Learn more at seattle.gov slash winter dash weather. All right, all y'all. It's time for Right Here, Right Now. Well, Kevin, a lot of attention right now on this new proposal, the KCRHA, the Regional Homelessness Authority, has unveiled to shelter tens of thousands of people over the next five years, but maybe not a lot of surprises here. It's great to have this five-year plan. We were looking forward to it, but how does the agency generate this $253 million budget it's asking for? Because the money we're talking about here, it's attached to Seattle, it's attached to King County mainly. It has a lot of strings attached to it, and I think that's an important part of this. Oh, yeah, you're right. And, you know, this is exactly what everybody predicted. All the yeah. funders, most notably Seattle and King County, are being extremely prescriptive with how to spend the money that they're giving the RHA. And, and you know, again, everybody predicted this, right? It wasn't yeah. like the Seattle City Council and the Seattle mayor were going to say, oh, yeah, here's $80 million. Just, you know, <laughs> do what you think is best, right? right. Yeah, but well, whatever you think is best, we're, we're we're good with that. No, they were extremely prescriptive, telling them which you know organizations to fund, exactly how much to put into what, all sorts of earmarks for specific uh, causes and org organizations. So, you know, at the end of the day, the amount of discretionary funds that Mark Jones has to do what they think, you know, is right uh, and to implement their five-year plan. There's almost nothing, right? They're going to have to go look for other, they're going to have to get new funding with no strings attached yeah. from federal government, which has its own funding with strings attached, or right. the state government, which, you know, is going to do the same thing, or, you know, convince Seattle and King County not to be completely prescriptive with their funding. Good, yeah. good luck with that. Yeah, right. no, I and I, I've seen some of these headlines here about uh, President Biden talking about investing some more money into homelessness over the next couple of years, but I, I am trying to think of that next piece. Is there any chance that KCRHA, for example, could get more funding from the state? We're going to touch on the governor's uh, budget in just a couple minutes here. But do you see, see the state lawmakers possibly helping out with this effort? Oh, yeah, I, I, I think I think that's very likely. But it's a big state. Homelessness yeah, right. is a problem everywhere. 
right? Yeah. King County is the largest state, uh, largest county in the state, but at the same time, you know, King County and Seattle don't control all the legislators, right? Well, They're all going to want a piece of, of a big pot of money that's going towards homelessness, and and rightfully so. But again, it's a problem yeah. throughout the state. Yeah, statewide right? problem for sure. But I, I wanted to make sure I dove into this discussion uh, that has been around, of course, for as long as homelessness has been, been around, which is, do we spend more money on temporary shelter? Do we spend more money on permanent housing? We need to get people inside. It's urgent, all that kind of thing. We have seen this play out for years here in Seattle and, and basically every other metro area around the country here. Where's that going to land in terms of what the RHA wants to do here? Is it going to be more money for temporary shelter to get people inside quickly? Or, or where do you see that going? It, it's going to be both. It's going to be more uh, because yeah. there are political forces pushing in both directions, right? And unfortunately, what that means is, uh, you know, for the five-year plan and for everything else, the one thing Jones has been really good at is trying to push things like the point in time count and all that to yeah. get really crisp about like, okay, how many people are we really dealing with here? Mm -hmm. So that you could potentially make a plan that says, okay, this is a plan that's going to deal with all of them. Yeah. Right. The price tag for that is going to be huge, but at least we know what a plan looks like and would cost to address all of them. And we're not going to do that. Right. We're right. going to go back to the, we're going to continue on with the politician's standard approach here of, mm. well, you know, we're, it, it's not about sort of solving the problem, but showing that we're putting more resources on it. Right. Yeah. So every year you can say, look, we added twenty five million dollars more. Mm -hmm. We added 50, you know, whatever amount more than we did last year. Look, we're doing something about it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and and so, you know, given this dichotomy between sort of the politically expedient thing of showing, okay, we're putting more into it versus we're actually have a, we have a plan and we're funding it to solve the plan. They're yeah. going to do the former, not the latter. Yeah. I, it's, it's interesting to see this because we're supposed to hear more about where some of these budget dollars are going to be coming from next month. But I'm really interested to watch how this plays out because I, I don't know, you've got these city funders, you've got these county funders, you've got these state funders there. And I just don't know if enough has been if enough has been proven with the RHA. Do they have that data you're talking about? Because I've actually heard some rumblings that they might not end up doing the point in time count for 2023. It's not something that HUD, the Housing and Urban Development uh, on the federal level, requires every year. It's every two years. They might take a year off. I, I, I'm really interested to see what happens over the next month here and what what sort of data they're going to present that says, hey, this is the funding we need. I, do you have any thoughts about that? Questions about that? Well, the point in time count as it's been done does not deliver very accurate information. Yeah, that's a good point. And and the King County RHA has been good about pointing that out and saying, hey, yeah. let's not do the thing that doesn't give us very good information. Right, right. Um, you know, they, they've been very uh, high level about their their own approach to how to gather this information. They come up with, you know, big stats. You probably saw they just recently said over 60,000 people, I think it's 66,000 people, in, over the course of 2022 have experienced homelessness yeah. at some point, right, right? right? which just to be clear is distinct from saying at any given point in time, there are 66,000 people who all are homeless. Different. You know, yeah. The, the, there could be somebody, you know, people who come in and out of homelessness or homeless for, you know, two weeks yep. over the course yep. of the year, you spread that across the course of the year. And, you know, and, and that's really important because when you're planning for how to address homelessness, part of it is capacity planning, right? It's, you know, if we're if we're if we're resourcing shelter emergency shelter beds, then you need to know what's the maximum number of homeless people are going to be at any given time. Yeah. Right. Because that's how many you need. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We don't need sixty six thousand emergency shelter beds. Correct. Because we never have sixty six thousand um, homeless people at the same time. Right. So getting really good information and knowing, okay, you know, where does this max out? Yeah. Right. What what is the capacity at any given time that we need? You know, what's the peak capacity is really, really important to this. So if they're going to get to the point where they get that kind of information, that will be really helpful. Right. Yeah. The, yeah. the sixty six thousand number is interesting in one sense, but doesn't really help for a lot of the real logistical planning they need to do. Right. right? So that's the right. thing for us to watch out for. Are they yeah. getting the kind of information that helps them do better planning? Yep. Yep. That, uh, that's going to be fascinating to watch over the next couple of weeks here, and the dollars are going to be flying, or maybe they won't. I, I think that's going to be something to keep track of. I did want to move along the housing spectrum with you, if I could, Kevin. An interesting legal case for the city of Seattle getting sued over its mandatory housing affordability program, MHA. Anita and Vance Adams, they're from the Central District. They're filing the suit. 
they're facing the reality of getting charged $75,000 to build on their property, money that would go towards building affordable housing. This is this MHA requirement. It kicks in on bigger projects. But Kevin, this is a family, this is a family, as I understand it, that's simply trying to house other members of the family, adult children, some aging parents. What do you see going on here? Well, so there's a couple of parts. One of this uh, is, so what? It, what is MHA, right? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a, which is really a legal question more than anything else. When it was first okay. rolled out, it's like, this is a development fee that we're tacking on to, you know, developing a property. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and because of the way that's structured, uh, so it's not just a sort of government taking, they have to give something back yeah. that's of equivalent value. So mm -hmm. what they decided to do is the give back is increase the zoning capacity on properties. Right. Right. So right. they did this, you know, this piece by piece around the city rezone, upzone, literally. Yep. Yep. To give more capacity to basically be the compensation for for the fee. Now what the Adamses are saying is, no, it's not actually a development fee. It's an impact fee. It's mm -hmm. meant to address the impacts on the city and infrastructure and, and traffic and all that, that right. come from increased development, in which case there's a different legal standard for that, that uh, relates to uh, how to, um, uh, that relates to um, how big an impact fee can be and what's and what the money is used for. Okay. And the law says that an impact fee um, has to be tied to an actual measurement of the impact that it's having. You can't okay. charge an impact fee that's much larger than the impact that a project is, is actually sure. having. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they're saying, no, no, this is a development fee. This is an impact fee. And the city, when it imposed it, didn't really do any of the analysis around what the actual impact is. So, so that's yeah. the legal argument they're having in court. Right. Right. The, the the problem that the Adamses are having with this is they're in a catch twenty two. Right. 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 Um, they want to know. Yeah. The 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 city is saying yeah, it's probably going to be like a seventy seven thousand dollar fee, and there's yeah. a possibility they could get it waived. Right. Because but, they're just trying yeah. to buy some. They're, they're just trying to build some extra units in their backyard. Yeah. So to house more family members. Right. They're not trying but, to create a whole new like apartment complex. Right. Thing. But they actually so, have to apply for the permit to kind of get things going. That's that's where it right. gets a little crazy. And, and to apply for the permit. Yeah. They have to have architectural fees. So before they yep. spend several tens of thousand dollars to yep. go get um, an architect to develop the whole plan and architectural you know, diagrams and all that stuff for yes. them, they want to know whether it's going to be possible to get a waiver on this $77,000 fee. Because if they have to pay the $77,000, it's not right. going to be an affordable project for them. Right? Right. They're not going to be able to do it. Right. And, but the city is saying, no, we can't actually tell you whether we can give you a waiver oh, until boy. you actually <laughs> apply for the permit. Yeah. So, so, you know, they're, they're stuck either way if yeah. they go forward with this. And I just, in looking at this, Kevin, does it help, help with this uh, concept or I guess a, provide any answers to this question of is MHA working? Because I think this family is kind of drawing that issue out you know they're saying well you, we're still getting gentrified in different neighborhoods like the central district is mha really doing what it said it would do because a lot of times when you know these new uh different townhomes etc come in they are more expensive they don't necessarily cater to the people who are still in the neighborhood there and these traditionally black neighborhoods like where the adamses are they're not they're not as black these days i mean that's that's the fact of the matter i just do you think about that that larger issue of is mha working yeah, you know, it's a good question. And so at, at the simplest level, is MHA bringing in money to, mm. to be put yeah. on affordable housing right. projects? Yes, absolutely it is. It is. Yep. And there's an annual report that's put out every year that shows that, yeah, there's money coming in. Uh, and the city is trying to spread that money around the city. Uh, there, you know, there's a kind of squishy requirement in MHA when it was passed saying that yep. funds raised from kind of generally a neighborhood have to go back into that neighborhood, at least if people are right. paying, you know, fees in lieu of actually building out the affordable units themselves. Right. Um, right. Right. And, and, but, but it's pretty squishy as to what kind of the same general area of the city means for that, but, yeah. but it's a big wow. city and they have to spread the stuff around all over the place. Sure, sure. And, and particularly if, you know, a lot of the MHA fees are coming from downtown. Uh, yeah, where right. where the big projects are, right? That's where the big mm -hmm. fees are coming in, which means a lot right. of those funds have to go back into those areas. And at the same time, it still takes years to get the permits done and to uh -huh. get the, the you know, and, and 
you know, the, the bulk of MHA was passed in 2017, 2018, right, right. something like yeah, that. Right, administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, uh, so, and, and then with the pandemic in the middle of that, some projects got delayed. So, yeah. you know, MHA projects are being built right now. Right? Yeah. And it's more, HA, more MHA money that's come in that is being distributed out to more projects right now. Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff in the pipeline now. But yeah. we also need to remember that, you know, MHA wasn't designed to be an anti-gentrification project. That's right? true. Yeah. It's, a, it's an affordable housing project. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And and one can hope that MHA, along with a lot of other things together, will help fight gentrification. Sure. But you can't look at MHA alone and say, oh, that's a thing that's going to solve gentrification. Yeah. It's not going yeah. to do that. Right. Yeah. It's not at the scale to be able to do that. Right. Great observation. Thank you for that, Kevin. All right. Up next, Governor Inslee's budget proposal has a lot to say about affordable housing, and you might need to vote on a part of this, too. We're going to explain on Now Hear This. Well, Governor Jay Inslee laid out his annual state budget proposal last week with a heavy emphasis on housing. He noted that in the past 10 years, we've grown in Washington state by a million people in population terms, but we only have 315,000 housing units that have built, been built over that course of time. Homelessness definitely on everybody's mind here. And the governor says the only way to make a dent in that is to increase housing supply. We cannot fix homelessness unless we build more housing. And unfortunately, the market conditions exist that the private market will not produce the housing units we need to actually house the people who live in the state of Washington. OK, so, Kevin, there's a piece to this where voters are going to be asked to support parts of this proposal. I want to put that on hold for just a second here. I'm trying to figure out what happens now. We've got this 70 billion dollar proposal from the governor. Legislature just a few weeks out from starting up its session. So what happens at this point? Well, so it's going to go to legislature. Which will rewrite it or potentially discard yeah, it entirely, right? right? Uh, yeah. And and again, as we talked about earlier, uh, you know, the legislators are all going to want to have a piece of this to go to their own their own district, right? So, you know, it's a lot of money for the state, and it's going to get distributed across the state. And in some counties and some legislative districts, it's going to end up as a small small piece of money, and others is going to end up hopefully with a bigger piece of money. Um, and so far, there's no guidance as to where the housing will go. That will be up to legislator legislature to write. They're certainly not going to leave that up to uh, the the uh, Inslee administration to figure out, you know, exactly how to distribute the funds, um, because there are needs across the state. Yeah. And you know, even within King County, there's mm -hmm. going to be fighting this because there's homelessness, you know, in every city and town in an unincorporated King County. Oh yeah. Right. So. Um, it's going to take a lot of negotiating, divvy it up in a way that will that will garner a majority vote in the legislature come January when this comes up. Um, and then there's yeah. the tug of war, as we talked about earlier, between emergency housing and permanent housing. Right. right? Because yeah. Inslee intends for this money to go to both of those. Right. Yeah. So do you mm -hmm. how much do you put towards and, and money will go to both of them? How much do you put towards yeah. the short term thing that will reduce, the, you know, visible homelessness? in the long-term thing right. that will kind of be a, a, a you know, part of the longer-term solution for that. And, and let me move to the voter side of this. The governor talking about a statewide housing ballot measure. It would not add new taxes, but it would raise the state's debt limit by $4 billion. What's this all about? Right. So um, uh, the governor wants to uh, basically issue bonds, wants to borrow money uh, in order to pay for uh, this. And uh, that's a common thing to do uh, in, you know, at every level of government. Uh, it's kind of a, think of it as a cash flow thing, right? They want the money up front so that they can get going and building all the housing now. And they have, you know, enough guaranteed revenue streams that they can pay the debt service on this for, you know, 20, 25, 30 years going out, right? So they want to be able to issue a bunch of bonds so they don't have to do it, you know, in trickle it out in small pieces over 20 years. That's a good thing to do. But uh, the state is yeah. hitting up on its debt limit right now. So in order to be able to raise mm -hmm. the state's debt limit to be able to go do this, they have to pass a voter initiative. So we will see that come through. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we will. And I, I have to say, I'm also keeping a really close eye on the capital gains tax, which funds a big part of this potentially $70 billion budget from the governor here. And there's a chunk of it that's coming from these capital gains taxes. 
right in the middle of a legal challenge before the state Supreme Court. So stay tuned on this one. There's there's a lot happening, but we're kind of going housing happy on the uh, on this week here, Kevin, because I did want to make sure a little bit more about what was happening with I-135 here in the city of Seattle. It's coming up this vote in February, February 14th. This one, it's going to sneak up on us, but this is this is the deal. Here it comes. I-135, this is for social housing, creating a new housing development authority for public housing that would essentially be run by the renters who'd be in these housing units. Kevin, I find this fascinating because everybody supports the idea of affordable housing, but not all of our housing agencies are on the same page with this. The Housing Development Consortium definitely spoke out against this. They said, hey, we already have mechanisms to build affordable housing. Why do we need another agency? Let, let's break this down. What's I-135 all about? Where, where do you see this going? Yeah, so we actually have the Seattle, Seattle Housing Authority right now. And we have some other housing authorities at the county and state level that, that, that fund affordable housing. And as we talked about earlier, the money that they get, the funding they get, has strings attached to it. And the Seattle Housing Authority is mostly funded mm. by HUD, the, the, the Federal uh, Department of Housing and, and Urban Development. And their money, when it comes in, says that the housing they build has yep. to be um, focused on lowest income folks, right? Usually, in many cases, like at least you know, below 60% of annual median income, often lower than that, right? So, um, yeah. That's where the Seattle Housing Authority's focus has been. This notion, the, the, the idea really behind this new um, social housing thing uh, is that social housing is a different thing. And if you look at a place like Vienna, Austria, you see like a really good model for how social housing works, where they can build out housing mm. at multiple price points right? Where some of it is really focused on the lowest income folks, but also some focus on people making 80% of AMI, or in fact, like up to maybe even 120%, 100, 120% of AMI. So you get mixed income communities, right. which in generally pe people think is, is a good thing, particularly because uh, when you're creating housing for kind of the market rate or people at, at sort of 100, 100%, 100 to 120% of income, you're helping to fund mm -hmm. the lower income, right? Because you've got, that's what they're you've saying. got a it's more mixed revenue right. stream that's coming in, right? Mm -hmm. So um, th if they can set up this new housing authority that's free of those sort of federal restrictions and, and can go yeah. find funding from other sources as well, mm -hmm. um, then it can create housing that's targeted to a wider range of incomes. What you see in places like Vienna is that by doing that, Vienna actually yeah. builds a ton of market rate housing that uh mm. public housing owned by, owned by the government rented out to people at market rates right. and what they find that it does is it actually regulates market prices right because the city itself is a major player in the housing market mm. private housing you know uh, you know uh, housing vendors actually have to respond to the pricing that the city is doing right so it can it can stop you know skyrocketing rent because um, because the city is involved and it can choose the prices that it wants to charge on its own. So there can be some real value to the market as a whole in actually having uh, you know, a, a government institution like a housing authority managing market rate housing on this, right? And the other the interesting part of the social housing model is that it, it's a self-governance model, right? That they could have a board uh, led by renters who are actually managing this whole um, mm -hmm. uh, housing authority itself and can and ha can have a say as to what projects get built, where they get built, what is the mix of, you know, rent prices that they're targeting in this, right? So it's not some nameless, faithless government mm -hmm. bureaucracy. It's real renters that are actually running this thing. Right. I, I did want to ask that question about money, though, because people in Seattle, I know they vote yes on a lot of stuff, just about everything. But is there enough of a question about funding? that this I-135 is going to stall out? Where do you see the vote going? Yeah, it's, and it's it's interesting. The opposition to this is coming largely from other housing authorities and, and, and housing vendors. Yeah. Say, oh, wait, this is one more thing that's going to compete for the funding sources. Maybe, you know, maybe not the federal funding sources with the strings attached, but there are a lot of private foundations that put money into affordable housing, right? And so it, mm -hmm. will this mean less money or more competition for money for the more established organizations that are going after those affordable housing dollars, right? That's where the opposition is coming coming from this. So, you know, yeah. how will this play out? You know, 
I don't hear a lot of people saying, oh, Seattle Housing Authority, two thumbs up. They're doing a great job out there. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You're doing it's a great job. Sure. It's right. kind of, yeah, it's kind of bureaucratic and, you know, it's not very transparent. Nobody really understands mm -hmm. how they're making a decision on this. So, you know, there's no right. great love for the Seattle Housing Authority. So, you know, we'll, we'll yeah. see, you know, we'll see how the PR plays out over the next couple of months, yeah. you know, as we get closer to this election and, you know, and, and the campaigns, you know, yes and no ramp up around this. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not sure that, hey, this is competing with the Seattle Housing Authority argument right. is really, you know, that, that, that could fall either way. There's going to be yeah. some people with vested yeah. interest in the existing system who are going to say, Oh yeah, that competes with the Seattle Housing Authority. That's clearly a bad idea. And other folks say, "Oh, it competes with the Seattle Housing right. Authority. That's a good idea. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> we, right. we, we want people keeping them honest, right? We want we want we want them yeah. working harder and being more transparent. And when we can think of, you yeah, know, if we can create a new thing that does better, good. Let's do that. Right, right. A big vote coming up in February. We should keep tabs on that one, folks. A lot of debate ahead. All right, coming up, a look at the biggest headlines we're looking forward to in 2023. Kevin, a contributor to the South Seattle Emerald, has some ideas on our podcast gem of the week. All right, Kevin, let's break it down. That local headline you're most looking forward to seeing in E3. And I'm guessing you're going to have a number of ideas here, but I, I'm going to throw it out there. Maybe it's how are we going to celebrate multiple 100-year anniversaries? You got Disney and Warner Brothers turning 100 next year, the Milky Way candy bar, and the centennial celebration of the presidency of Calvin Coolidge. Huge parties waiting to happen on all fronts there. What are you looking forward to in 2023, my man? Oh, I hadn't heard about Calvin Coolidge, but now that you mentioned it, I mean, clearly that's, that's a big one. That's the obvious yeah, one. Right. Yeah, well, so, I, you know, <laughs> yeah, the headline right, right. I'm really looking forward to next year is Mariners make the playoff for the second year in a row. That's, you know, it, that's love it, my love thing, it. Right? But, but, you know, yeah. I mean, in this more serious side, I, I'm curious as to who's going to run for the city council, right? We're going to, you yeah. know, it's going to be an election year locally here. You know, we're going to have a mid-May deadline. Uh, obviously, we're going to see a lot of people declare their candidacy uh, before that. I'm kind of surprised given we've had a couple of city council members. I already see they're not running, that we haven't had any, but anybody jump in yet. Maybe they're yeah. all having kind of their holiday conversations with their partners first to say, all right, can I really do this? Um, and then maybe first week of January, the, you know, the, 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 the dam breaks on that, but, uh, certainly yeah. by, you know, by May, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be mid May, we'll know who's running. And I think that's going to be some, some interesting, uh, headlines right there. Oh, it's massive. I just remember four years ago, seven seats were up and here we go again with seven seats. I almost wonder if it might be worth it to try to stagger some of those seats in a certain way, but I'm sure that some districts would say, well, you can't put us behind or whatever else, but it's such it's such a potential massive turnover for the city council every four years. It, it wasn't always like that. And I think it's, uh, I don't know, this is what districts uh, has brought us, not necessarily a bad thing to see this kind of change, but it's potentially a massive change on the council. I mean, d do you see a lot of seats changing hands possibly? I mean, I, I got to say the city council for all the different work it's been doing is not all that popular right now. And we heard from council member Herbold when she decided not to run again a couple of weeks ago, she said just kind of the vitriol that's behind all these different races right now, that was kind of behind her decision not to run. Where do you, do you see any of these races as, as a council member being vulnerable or things like that? What do you think? Well, I, we know at least two, two seats are going to turn over of the seven, right? We're, right, we're right. 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 It wouldn't surprise me, you know, among, uh, you know, some of the other, uh, you know, first time, uh, you know, first term council members, if it wouldn't surprise me if one or two of them decided not to run again, just again, as you mentioned, with all the vitriol that goes into this, yeah. right? It's not right. just, you know, directed at them, but it's directed at their families, right? Yes. Their partner, Indeed. their kids, all that. Um, you know, it's a, you, you know, say what you want about whether you think they're doing a good job or not. And everybody, you know, is entitled to their opinion on that. It is a tough job, mm -hmm. right? It's a seven day a yeah. week job. Yeah you know, from, you know, sun up to, you know, well past sundown. Uh, and, right. uh, and they, they personally get harassed in the grocery store, their, their partners and kids get harassed in the yep. community. Yep. So, you know, it's, yep. it's, it's tough. There's a, there's only a certain amount that anybody really can take of that. And uh, so I, yep. I feel for all of them as, as to that. Um, but I mean, you are right. Yeah. It, uh, 
the you know the polls that are out there you know pretty consistently rate this the city council pretty low and a lot of that um stems from yeah how they're dealing with homelessness but also still backlash from the defund the, the you know defund spd by 50 yeah, percent yeah. uh things that they said in the in the summer of uh 2020 right that's that that yeah. is all an overhang that they're that they're still dealing with and you know we'll yep. we'll see you know a lot and you know we can look at council member Sawan as well who yeah. survived a recall which is essentially you know running against nobody right yes she re right. Re survived that by 300 votes right yeah if she ends up running much. against mm -hmm. somebody who's pretty popular and 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 has a you know yeah. a good resume she could be in, in trouble with this or not yeah. i mean and and then you know on top of all that we've got redistricting around this, yeah right, right. Where we right. change the shape of a bunch of these districts and that's going to yeah. change the math yeah. around yeah. Uh, around some of them as well yeah, a lot to look forward to here, here, Kevin. And Kevin, I have so enjoyed working with you over the past couple of weeks here while David Croman has been on a new dad leave here. I just wanted to say thanks a million, man. Thanks for helping me out. Well, uh, thanks for having me back for, uh, you know, uh, uh, a short stint here. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing you and Dave in the new year. Awesome, man. I, I might call you in for a few more pinch hitting gigs here. So keep keep that yeah, bat we'll handy. And I know we're going to be... Ready to you go. guys are doing a great job, though. You, I really, I listen to it every week. I really appreciate Thanks, your man. insights. Keep it up. Thank you. Ah, couldn't, couldn't have done it without you, Kevin. Thank Thanks, Kevin. Thanks to everybody listening to Seattle News, Views, and Brews, where you can always find out what's brewing in local politics. This podcast is on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen. Please find Seattle News, Views, and on Patreon, if you would. Please show your support. Really need it. Thanks also for watching on Converge Media, too. See you next time. Seattle News, Views, and Brews is an independent production of Callanan Media Services. Copyright 2022.